Good evening, everyone, and happy Tuesday. Thank you for tuning in. We're taking another field trip, so put on your walking shoes and let's get started. As you know, March is Women's History Month, and we have been highlighting the five honorees of the Audrey H. Lawson Impact Award. Our final two honorees are Mrs. Kirby Thomas Smith and Ms. Evelyn Washington. Kirby Thomas Smith is an award-winning entrepreneur and executive with a passion for business, education, and philanthropy. A former track star and athlete, Kirby has transferred her competitive drive and her spirit to help her excel in her professional endeavors. She began her career as a teacher, winning multiple Teacher of the Year awards, and is proud of her impact on the lives of underserved youth in inner cities of Houston and Atlanta. Kirby is currently the Chief Operating Officer of Active Faith Sports, the globally recognized Christian premium sports apparel brand, where she also gives leadership to the women's division. In these roles, she has been an integral part of the company's growth from infancy to becoming a global brand with sales in over 92 countries. Her leadership has been pivotal in the brand being named by Inc. Magazine as one of the 500 fastest growing private companies in America. The brand has been seen or featured in Sports Illustrated, Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, ESPN, and more. Active Faith has also won the Houston Chamber of Commerce's Upstart Business Award. Kirby has a passion for philanthropy and led the development of Active Faith's charitable nonprofit arm, The Helping Hands. In this role, she focuses on ways that the brand can give back and impact communities in need. Kirby received her Bachelor of Arts in English at Spelman College and earned her Master of Business Administration from the Jesse H. Jones School of Business at Texas Southern University. When Kirby isn't working, she spends her time as a volunteer coaching her former summer track team, Track Houston. After challenging herself to read more, Kirby formed her own book club, Between the Covers, which now has a wait list and has expanded to two additional cities. She formerly served as team lead for the Courtesy Corps here at Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church and is a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Kirby has been married to Lanny Smith since 2013. Evelyn J. Washington was born in Richmond, California and moved to Houston, Texas at an early age. Being raised by her grandparents, Evelyn had a front row seat to the daily lessons of giving something back caring for your neighbor, striving for excellence, and not accepting impossibilities. These tools for living were the foundation for the many cultural, social, and civic roles that she played in life. In 1974, Evelyn ignored the naysayers when she entered a white male-dominated profession of air traffic control. She leaped at the opportunity to fight the odds and successfully completed the three-year Federal Aviation Aeronautical Center's air traffic control program. In 1985, she became the first female air traffic manager for the Southwest region, which included Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. She continued to accelerate through the air traffic system, becoming the hub manager for all air traffic facilities in the state of New Mexico, deputy regional administrator of the Great Lakes region of Illinois, and ultimately becoming a FAA senior executive in 1996. While in the FAA, Evelyn demonstrated her leadership qualities by being elected as the first female national president of the National Black Coalition of Federal Aviation Employees. During her 12-year tenure, she established and implemented programs that positively impacted minorities, women, and children. She expanded the organization's visibility by starting chapters in Anchorage, Alaska, as well as San Juan, Puerto Rico. Ms. Washington partnered with U.S. Congress officials secretaries of transportation and FAA administrators to identify, promote, and increase the representation of minorities in entry and management level positions. Along with the Tuskegee Airmen and Black Pilots Association, she developed summer ACE camps exposing minority children to aviation career opportunities. Evelyn is immensely proud of establishing the NBC FAE National Scholarship Program. This program continues to award deserving students enrolled in HBCUs. Ms. Washington has been recognized for her untiring efforts to eliminate discrimination in the workplace. She served as an Equal Employment Opportunity Counselor and was awarded the Elizabeth Dole Secretary of Transportation EEO Award. 
She also received the Golden Hammer Award from Vice President Al Gore and the Miami-Dade Bessie E. Coleman Award, honoring African-American women in aviation. After serving 38 years in the federal government, Ms. Washington retired to her home of Houston, Texas. She refused to stop serving her community and being involved in civic and service organizations. She is currently the president of the Blue Triangle Garden Club and a member of the Port City Chapter of Lynx Incorporated. The Blue Triangle Garden Club has a long history of providing annual support to the Blue Triangle's Community Center's youth programs. As Hell Facet Chair of the Port City Lynx Incorporated, the chapter was awarded highest honors out of 59 chapters for its DASH diet program. Though she thought she would retire, Ms. Washington has chosen to remain actively involved. She manages the daily operations of her daughter's medical office and wellness center. Evelyn also cares for her 95-year-old mother and is intricately involved in the lives of her three children, six grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. In her leisure time, she enjoys antique shopping, reading, traveling, and listening to jazz. How incredible. We are certainly grateful for all of the contributions that these women have made and are continuing to make in society. Houston's Third Ward has been identified as a food desert for as long as I can remember. If you are unfamiliar with the term, the United States Department of Agriculture defines food deserts as an herbal or rural town without quick access to fresh, healthy, and affordable food. Unfortunately, with over 500,000 Houstonians living in an area with little to no access to healthy food, that's the reality for many people who may be watching this right now. However, if you are without personal transportation, the issue is even greater as the average grocery store could be at least three miles away from your home. If you watched our series last month, Vitamins, Veggies, and Vacations, you know that living in a food desert contributes to increased obesity rates, heart disease, and diabetes. The good thing is that there are a few restaurant owners and other organizations in Third Ward and in the Houston area who are committed to alleviating this issue. According to HoustonCaseManagers.com slash Houston dash food dash deserts, there are four ways to get healthy food in a food desert. One, find a community garden near you. Number two, visit a farmer's market. Thirdly, contact the Houston Food Bank for pantries near you. And lastly, you can sign up for Amazon Fresh Grocery Deliveries. While you're on their website, you can also use their interactive USDA map to see if you are living in a food desert. Speaking of community gardens, the Blodgett Urban Gardens is a nonprofit 501c3 charitable organization dedicated to sustainable gardening, healthy eating, and community education. We're heading down the street to learn more about what they do and how we can support. We're here at the Blodgett Urban Gardens with Dr. Kimberly Adams. Thank you so much, how are you? I am good, thank you so much for inviting me. Wonderful, well how did all of this begin? So Blodgett Urban Gardens began as a research project in a classroom one day in 2012. At TSU? At Texas Southern University, yes. I was obtaining my um, PhD in urban planning and environmental policy in a class with Dr. Cherie Smith, who teaches um, research in, in the urban planning department. And someone walked in into the um, into our room, knocked on the door, and they were hungry from the community. And so we had snacks and stuff on our desk that we usually eat in the afternoon. And so, you know, we gathered up everything that we had, and so and that spurred the conversation. It was a research topic class, and so we literally at that very moment changed our research topic to food insecurity in the uh, th greater third world community. Wow, so that's, you know, food insecurity is right up our alley. We're talking about food deserts and how Houston and specifically the third world community has been affected by this town being a food desert. Can you describe to us or explain what a food desert is and how Third Ward is affected? Absolutely, so a food desert is an area where individuals who are um, in low income communities cannot um, easily access fresh fruits and vegetables, whether they are organic or not. So that means that in this particular community, each individual, especially in the low income um, por portions of Third Ward, have to take either a bus for public transit or drive over two miles to the nearest grocery store. Wow. And so previously there were other grocery stores or entities that called themselves grocery stores, but they had less than 50% fresh fruits and vegetables. 
And so if you think back to some of those um, entities that were in the community maybe five years ago and then what your grocery stores look like now, then you can imagine that transition from going from a grocery store with less than 50% fresh fruits and vegetables to a grocery store with 85% fresh fruits and vegetables. So how long has the food desert been an issue here? Because I remember being in high school talking about food desert. So how long has Houston always been that way or third ward? It has. I cannot say that it has always been that way, but I can definitely say that since the, um, the I hate to use air quotes, but white flight in the third world community, probably in the 50s and 60s, then it became a food desert. And so um, there's been opportunities and, um, and different methods that people in the community have tried to mitigate that. If you think about Palm Center, that um, had a garden and uh, farmer's market that was there. You think about Freedman's Town with the same thing. And all of these different places, you've had community activists that have attempted to mitigate food insecurity, but each time or each time a farmer's market was added, a grocery store was removed. Wow. Well, can you talk to us a little bit about your partnership with Manor House, which is directly behind us? How, how, has, how did that start and what do you all do? So Manus House was a great, um, you know, I would say introduction. So last year we were out here, uh, well actually about two years ago, really in 2019, we were expanding the garden. And so initially the garden was only about 20 beds. And so, but it is 2.5 acres. And so we began to expand the garden. And what, when we began the expansion process, the board members just walked over and introduced themselves and asked how could they get involved? And so from there, a, com a com uh, conversation and a collaboration ensued. And so right now we provide um, fresh produce, organic fruits and vegetables to help supplant the weekly food drive that Manus House provides to the community. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the food drives in our community are also plagued with not having access to fresh fruits and vegetables. And so that is one of the other important things that we do here is help provide that to, um, to the community. Blige Urban Gardens provide culturally sensitive fresh fruits and vegetables and the things that people in this community seek from the grocery store, but unfortunately oftentimes cannot find. Well, let's take a walk through and, and I want to know what some of these things are. Um, we see lots of greens here, so can you describe to us what, so you have different sections. So what, let's start here. What is this? What is this area this here? Is, this is what we call our phase four. Okay. So because there's 92 beds here, this is a phase. Wow. Yes, this is a phase four um, process. And so here we have um, minimum raised beds. And so we um, ensure this is winter crops right now. Okay. And so as you can see, we have bok choy um, that is really popular in, um, I would say the Asian community. Then we have mustard greens that are really popular in the African-American community. Broccolini. Um, we have kale, so nice. all of your Braxis um, type products um, out here. What you can see underground, we have um, Detroit Red Beets, which is very, very popular here. Uh, anyone that hates beets, try a Detroit Red Beet. So what's the difference between regular beets and Detroit Red Beets? They are a deep, huge red beet. They are sweet. You can eat them like um, chips, um, wow. raw, and they are so, so delicious. Because of the crispness, you can also put them like in an air fryer for a few minutes okay. and um, eat them as chips, or you can just bake them and eat them soft in a dish. Nice. Well, you, you mentioned that people are able to come and you know check out the produce here. So what is the process? Is there a limit on how much people can take? What, what do they have to go through as a first timer? No, and so we really, really rely on the community. Uh, first timers, you know, or repeat customers or repeat volunteers. We take volunteers um, weekly on Saturdays right now. We're looking to increase that. But right now we have a farmer's market on Saturdays from nine to 12. If the temperature is below 45 degrees, we're not open. Okay. However, if someone wants to stop by and get fresh fruits and vegetables, when they see us here, just let us know and we'll assist. Now, how much do you have to pay? We provide everything to the community for donations only. Nice. And so everyone does not have money to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables. And so we actually provide that and we have a lot of volunteers that come in and they will volunteer their time to have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So if someone wants to pick up some um, fruits and vegetables, 
how do they pick it themselves? What if they have no expertise in gardening? So when we're here, we would do that for them. Okay. And so one of the other things that we encourage the community, because we're not always here, and that means that people are sometimes hungry when we're not here. Mm -hmm. And if the community, and that's the other reason why we tried our best to maintain an open community process so people can come in and get what they need for their families right. and not feel as though, oh, I have to wait until Saturday when someone is there. And so the only thing that we ask is, please don't take the plants. And so if you take the plants, then we can continue to do what we're doing. And so that is the biggest um, and one of the greatest challenges that we have in our community right now. Okay, so what are some of the sustainable gardening te techniques that you all teach? So some of the, um, the biggest and most important, I would definitely say, would be the rotation of crops. And so if you're familiar with like, uh, you know, people in that black history, this is black history time frame, you know, um, we're just finishing up with that with Black History Month. And so understanding that John Mitchell created the rotation of crops after the South was depleted from, um, the soil was depleted from nitrogen because of tobacco growth. Wow. And so fresh fruits and vegetables could not grow at that time, but understanding that there are certain plants that you can plant that will naturally replenish the soil with the nitrogen required so the plants can grow green. And wow. so what you're seeing right here is phase three. And we're having a crop rotation. So it has rested across the winter. Now we have um, tilled it and we're getting ready to plant the spring crops. One of the things that we would plant to my left is going to be beans. Beans replenish nitrogen. And so we will ensure that all of our beans are on this side so we can replenish the nitrogen and then the winter crop will be stronger beginning in October of um, this year. Wow. So being directly across the street from TSU and having started at Texas Southern University, are there is there still a partnership there? Do they still come by and are able to learn about sustainable gardening? Absolutely. We have a strong partnership with Texas Southern University. We're actually on Texas Southern University's property. And so we lease this particular um, site from Texas Southern. If you're from the greater third war community, you may remember six dilapidated apartment buildings here. And that particular um, site was a nuisance to the university. Crime infested, uh, a lot of illegal activity. And so again, going back to that research project, and partnering with the city of Houston and Texas Southern University. The city of Houston came in and assisted in demolishing, doing eminent domain, and demolishing the um, apartment complexes that were empty. At that particular time, then the university took over the property, purchased the property from the city, and allowed Blodge Urban Gardens to lease it. Wow. And so it has been a lease process um, since 2012. Wow. Yep. Well, what goes into the upkeep here? Because I can imagine, you know, with the winter freeze that we had in 2021 and then with hurricane season and what, so I, I can imagine it's difficult sometimes to keep up depending on the weather. How, what has that been like for you? It's been a challenge. As you can see, um, some of our, all of our banana trees are, these are Asian oh, banana trees. Oh, wow. All of our Asian banana trees, our bamboo, and all of our fruit trees um, were destroyed in Winter Storm Fury. Mm. And so the banana trees grew back, but as you can see, they're damaged. Yes. They're not dead, they just need to be trimmed. As far as some of the upkeep, Blodgett Urban Gardens was one of the, uh, a recipient of the Community Achievement um, Award and the fi um, funds a couple of weeks ago from Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church. Nice. And as you can see right behind me, um, just today, we had pea gravel brought in, and so we are actually creating an ADA compliant bed so we can ensure that everyone from the community can come out and enjoy the garden. And so these are some of the things that, um, you know, it goes into the upkeep. We talk about replenishing the soil, so oftentimes we have to bring in additional soil. We um, have to um, purchase plants and other materials, you know, for the community. We're looking to create and install additional raised beds so that when other people um, come into the garden, everyone cannot bend over. So to ensure that we have ADA compliant raised beds for individuals to be able to still uh, volunteer and participate in every process of the garden is important to us. That is awesome. Now, which which area are we in now? We, we've moved to two different sides. What, what is this? Yes, yeah, so this is what we call phase one. 
Okay. And so um, notice I went from phase four, phase three, skipped phase two, and we're now in phase one. Yes. So phase one is where we allow um, individual families from the community to lease a plot and grow their own organic fruits and vegetables. And so we provide them with the soil, we provide them with the water, so all of the plots and beds are lined with a sprinkler irrigation system that was installed by um, Texas Southern University. And so they can come in, we provide tools, and we provide them with the plants. And so they can come in and grow their own um, crop and take home to their families. Wow, wonderful. So for somebody who wants to get started here or even just volunteer, what is that process like? How do we get in contact with you and the Houston, well, the Blodgett Urban Garden? So there's a couple of ways to get in contact with us. Um, if you want to volunteer, you can always come out and um, on Saturdays and, and do so. You can register groups. And so we um, oftentimes register different groups um, to come out and participate in the process. Everyone loves to volunteer with their friends and colleagues. Yeah. And so you can go to volunteerhouston.org and you can register and sign up to volunteer. Or you can go directly to our website at www.blogitsurbangarden.org. Org. Okay. And I know we're only three minutes away from Wheeler Avenue, but for those who still, you know, may not have noticed that this is here, what is your address? Where can we find you? How can we connect with you all on social media? So you can find us at um, 3216 Blodgy um, Street, again, right across from Texas Southern University. Um, you can also um, come out on Saturdays. We'll be here from 9 to 12. Um, if you wanted to connect with us on social media, our, our Twitter account is Blodgett Garden. Our uh, Facebook account is Blodgett Urban Garden. Um, our Instagram is Blodgett Urban Garden. <laughs> <laughs> the theme is the same, Blodgett yes. Urban Garden. And a lot of people have come to know us as Bug. So That's nice. B-U-G, Blodgett Urban Garden is the uh, first three letters. And so please come out. We, we, we thrive and we can only exist with the community and for yeah. the community by the community so um you know if you can't come out and volunteer there's always different ways to get involved it's through volunteer it's through activism it's through um, donations it's through community support so get involved some kind of way if it's not here get involved somewhere but we really do appreciate everything that Wheeler Avenue has done, and thank you so much for um, for interviewing me and giving us this opportunity to highlight what we're trying to do in this community. Of course. Well, thank you so much for your time. We've made it to the end or the beginning of <laughs> the garden, so our tour is done. Thank you so much for just sharing all of this information that we may not have even known being right here in the community. So I appreciate, we all appreciate the work that you're doing here for Houston. Thank you. After we spoke, Dr. Adams informed me that the majority of her patrons are affluent people who are also white and or Asian. With Third War being predominantly African American, it would be great if we could take advantage of the opportunities for health and wellness that are right here in our community. Let's do what we can to support the Blodgett Urban Gardens, whether it's by volunteering, patronizing, donating, or just spreading the word. Additionally, if you are interested in learning more about how to maintain good health, the following organizations offer nutrition classes. The Houston Food Bank, WIC, Urban Harvest, and the City of Houston Don Program. Thank you all for tuning in this evening. That's all for tonight. See you next time on The Avenue.